Hello everybody, welcome to the United Stands. Are Ineos and Sir Jim Radcliffe taking a major transfer risk by looking to buy a winger like Michael Alisi? Also, Marcus Rashford, does he have an excuse? It's come out today that he has an injury and has been carrying an injury for the last two months. Is that an excuse for his poor form? this season. We've also got an amazing interactive bit for you a little bit later. Where would you like to see Manchester United playing their games if we have to move away from Old Trafford why it's rebuilt? We've got five options. You will vote on those in a moment. Also, a bit of a blow for a Man United player on loan whose season is over. And we're going to talk Scott McTominay doing great things for Manchester United in the goal front. Should we be cashing in? Should we be moving forward without McTominay? We'll talk about that as well. And as usual your normal stuff live at seven o'clock tonight because we're doing England against Belgium at 7.45. Kobe Mainu is starting for England, so I'm sure you're going to want to join me for that watch along as well. How are we all doing this evening? Well, look, I'm going to start off with topical. We do want to talk about Elisi. I really want to get into this. There's a poll going on at the moment whether you would sign Elisi for £50 million. Pounds. We're bringing it back into the news because, remember, we spoke about this two and a half weeks ago. It was a Sunday morning, and I said Elisi is basically a done deal. From A-star sources, it's basically a done deal. He wants to come to United. The release clause, Palace can't stop it. It's just about whether United follow through with it or not. And the word on the street is that Ineos really do want to follow through for Michael Elisi. But if their budget's only 200 to 250, is it worthwhile spending 25% on a right winger when that is not a priority ahead of right back, left back, two centre backs, midfielder and a striker? So we'll talk about that, of course. But I want to start topically. Henry Winter, respected journalist in the UK, definitely a big fan of Marcus Rashford, speaks and tweets about him quite, quite regularly. He is part of the England camp and has said that Marcus Rashford has been carrying an injury since the game against Nottingham Forest, which I think was a couple of months ago. So is this an excuse for Rashford's poor form? Now, I think back to that game. Rasmus wasn't fit. I think it was the FA Cup, actually. So it wasn't two months ago, was it? I think it... Well, maybe it was two months ago now. Um, Rash, uh, Rasmus wasn't fit. So he um, he played up front. Remember, he got sandwiched in the box. I actually thought it should have been a penalty. Well, that's the suspicion, is that he's injured something involving that. And ever since then, Rashford has been carrying a, a, a bit of an injury. Is that a bit of an excuse for him? You know, we, we, we struggle. You know, on the one hand, people will say, no, 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 it's not an excuse. But on the other hand, there has to be an excuse. You know, I refuse to believe that Marcus Rashford went from last season to this season and there's not something there. I don't, you know, I know I call him a light switch footballer because because sometimes the light's on and sometimes it's off. But, uh, and he's not starting for England tonight, by the way. Um, but look, you know, maybe, maybe there is. Maybe, maybe there is. Maybe there is a reason why Rashford isn't doing well this season. I don't know. I'll throw that in. And we'll inter intertwine it into the show. But let's talk about Michael Elisi. Um, right. OK, so 61% of you wouldn't sign Michael Elisi. 39% of you would. Who is he? He's a Crystal Palace winger. Um, he offers something really different to everything else that we've got. Yes, he is quick, but he's not like Rashford direct quick. He's not like Ganacho in relation to, I think, Ganacho's sort of a fusion between somebody like a Sancho and a Rashford. I'd say Michael Elisi is more Sancho. And I'm not saying he's similar, but he is that sort of player that's intricate, creative, uh, and can make things happen. So we don't have a winger like that. In fact, the only winger that we do have like that is Pelistri or maybe Ahmad, who we haven't really seen enough of as a winger yet. So look, Michael Elisi, as a player, if we didn't have enough wingers, I would sign him. If if right wing was a priority for Manchester United, I would sign him. £50 million, pounds, early 20s, proven in the Premier League, the right type of winger, the release clause is there, you're not going to get messed about by Palace. I'd go and do the deal. If right wing was a high priority for Manchester United, I would go and do the deal. So I'm not going to spend any time talking to you about his injury record, which is a bit of a concern. Or, you know, obviously, I'm not going to mention his personality or anything like that because I don't know it. And that should always be done now by the club. Um, look, if, he, if we need a right winger and it's a priority, then, yeah, I, I would say go ahead, do it. Homegrown player as well, classed as homegrown. Um, yeah, let's go and do it. 
My issue with this deal is that, and look, I know, I know it's very, very likely to happen. As we said two and a half weeks ago, Ineos are, you know, very, very comfortable with doing this deal. They like it. They feel it symbolizes a, a major signing that's exciting, that isn't going to break the bank, that is homegrown um, and, and, and is a player that's going to get bums off seats. And look, Ineos want to do a lot of things. They do not want to spend loads of money on big super signings, but they are going to want something from the summer that is progressive for them. And what I mean by that is Michael Alisi could be their star signing of the summer. And they will want one. They will want signings that are statement signings. And I think Alisi could be their, you know, their, their star signing, really. Their, their, their exciting signing. The signing that says this is us. Because, of course... They want to make clever signings. They want to use the money well. They want to sell players. They want to bring players in. But I think there is a desire by anybody who owns a football club and is coming in to go, that's one for us. That's one that's working for us. And I think maybe Michael Alisi is there because I do feel there's a transfer risk there. I do, because as I said, if we need a right winger, why not sign him? But we definitely need a left back. I think we need a right back. I think we need two centre backs. We definitely need a striker. And I think we need another midfielder. So on that, he has to be, even if we don't buy a right right back, he's still one, two centre-backs, left back, midfielder, striker. He'd still be sixth priority. Um, that's the problem with it for me. I, I just think that, is it a luxury we could do without? Is it a risk we've made before? Is it a mistake in the making that we've done previously? Anana wasn't a player we had to go and get last summer. I think it'll work out well, but we could easily have kept De Gea for another year and spent that £50 million on a centre-back. Um, Mason Mount wasn't a player we needed to buy last year. Forget the injury. You know, obviously we know we shouldn't have bought him last summer based on the injury, but we didn't need to buy Mason Mount last year. We could have spent that £50 million on a centre-back or a striker as well. So my concern with this is not that the player isn't good enough for Manchester United. My concern with this is, are we spending a proportion of a limited budget on a on a position that's not priority because we've made that make, we've made that mistake before we've done it with mount and we've done it with anana good players good signings but we didn't buy priority signings to spend 100 million pounds on non priority signings that we could have waited for and all i want to see this summer is i don't want to sign a right winger whether it's elisi or neto for 50 million quid if it means we only buy one center back or we don't buy a midfielder you know, I don't mind doing this deal as long as we get the priorities in. And two centre-backs, full-backs, midfielder, striker have to be the priority. That's the risk for me. I think people will be saying, yeah, let's go and sign him because he's an exciting player. There's no doubt about that. But what we do know about Man United, and it's not going to change with Ineos, is that we do have a limited transfer budget and we have to be very careful with that. Um Oh, interesting one from Mika coming in here. Super chat. Thank you very much for that, Mika. Get your thoughts in. He says, it's not direct that you, Mark. Don't worry. I've got a, I've got a shield. But Rashford's been bad all season. And that Oli slash Ranić season was diabolical. I like Rashi, but he's too inconsistent. Look, honestly, next season has to be Rashford's last if we sign, uh, uh, says... Um, says uh, Joe Dot. Why aren't we in for Alfonso Davies, says Jack. I think he's going to go to Real Madrid, that's why. And um, and Kian says, if you quit this channel, will you still do United watch-alongs? What's all this talk of me quitting? This is the second time in a row we've had this. I mean, I, I need a little bit of more context here. What's going on? Um, look, in relation to the Rashford thing, I mentioned at the start of the show that it's come out that he's been carrying an injury for two months. Is it an excuse for bad form? I've thrown it to you on purpose. You want my opinion, I'll give you my opinion. Of course it isn't. He wasn't injured in October. He wasn't injured in September. He wasn't injured in November. He wasn't in injured in December. Like, he's been bad all season. You know, maybe an injury is hindering him at the last two months, but he's been injured all season. He's not been injured all season, has he? So, look, of course it's not an excuse for bad form. Um, it might be something we need to keep an eye... My... My concern about that is, is that injury going to turn into, oh, I can't play this game or, or I'm out for a month or something like that. That's that's my only concern from that story that's come out today. I don't think it's a, a reason for bad form. His form has been bad all season. So I, I don't know why it is. We probably never get to the bottom of it. But, uh, I you know, I'm more interested in, you know, 
whether he can stay fit to the end of the season. Because he's not going to get a rest. You know, Kobe Mainu starting for England. Can't wait to do that watch along with you. Um, we'll be doing that straight after this, of course. But um, Rashford's not going to get a rest either, either, is he? Bad season for Manchester United. Hopefully he can fin finish it well. Straight into the Euros. Straight into a tour. Straight into a new season. You know, where is this downtime for Rashford mentally and physically? We're not going to see it, are we? I don't understand the problem with us and Nice on regards of European football. As far as we know, Radcliffe only owns 25%, so he does not so he does not own us yet. I don't know what you're talking about, Mario, because Beth did a show earlier saying that um, it doesn't actually matter in relation to uh, UEFA will let us play uh, in both tournaments. Alisi is very questionable signing considering his injury issues. Are Ineos looking into his injury record? We need midfielders, defenders and a backup striker, says Nigel. Um... I'm, I'm so, look, 60% wouldn't take a Lisi, 40% would take a Lisi. That's where we are at the moment in relation to that. But as I said, I think it is a bit of a risk because you are going to spend a considerable amount of money on a right winger. And I just don't, I don't know how it works. But what I will say to you is we can't sweep it under the carpet. The, the talks have been going on for a while. Elisi wants to come to United. Unless, unless United pull out, we will probably sign Elisi, but I will admit it is a confusing one, especially under a new regime when we criticised the Mount and Anana signings as being not priorities. I don't think anybody looked at Anana and thought bad player. I don't think anybody looked at Mount and thought bad player. I just think we were confused by the deals going, they're not the priorities. Like we shouldn't be getting... Mount and Anana, 100 million quid, should have been Kim Min Jae and a striker. We should have bought two strikers last summer and a centre-back. And... We didn't. We didn't need Mount and we didn't need Anana last summer. I would have waited a year for the goalkeeper. But, you know, if we go and get Elisi this summer, Rashford, Gracho, Ahmad, Anthony, Elisi, five wingers. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, does it? Uh, the problem I have with Elisi and Tony is they won't like to be benched and starting them would affect Rasmus and Ganacho. Also, a centre-back is much more needed, says AM United. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not leaving the channel, Ari, and I don't know why that's coming out. Uh, Savage says, if we sell Anthony and Sancho, then we definitely need a winger, but we're not going to sell Anthony Savage because no one's going to buy him. Our defence and CDM should be the priority, says Paul Tyndale. Um, has he got the work ethic for a Ten Hag team, says Joseph? I, I Look, I, I haven't seen enough of Elisi to know what his work ethic is. I haven't seen enough of Elisi to know what his attitude is. That's scouting for Manchester United. What I have seen from Elisi is that if we wanted a right winger, I'd sign him. Because he plays in a Crystal Palace team where you have to work hard. You know, you don't have 60% possession playing on the opposition's edge of the box. Most of the time you're defending. So he will have a work ethic. Look, as a signing, I don't have a problem with it, apart from it ain't a priority for Manchester United. Um, let me just bring you a little bit more topical news as well. Bit of sad news. Dan Gore, um, a player that I really like, and I think a lot of you like as well, young midfielder for Manchester United, um, went on loan to Port Vale. At, uh, I think he went in the January transfer window, didn't he? I don't think he went in, in the summer. But look, he hasn't played for them since the end of January. Their manager has come out um, and basically said, I think it's Darren Moore, isn't it? He's basically said that uh, we had hoped to have him back by now. Um, that's not going to happen. And it's looking difficult for the end before the end of the season. Of course, uh, the, um, the leagues outside of the Premier League, they basically finish at the end of April because they have the playoffs. And I don't think Port Vale are going to be involved in that. So... In fact, I don't think they're anywhere near the playoffs in their league. So Dan Gore looking like it's a it's another loan deal for another Man United player that's not gone that well. There's nothing you can do about injury. It's been the season of injury for Manchester United. I think we just have to wish him all the best and hope that he can get himself back fit for pre-season. And it will probably be another loan unless he can really hit the, um, the, uh, the, um, the tour. Because we will be taking some of the up and coming players on the tour because there'll be a lot of players hopefully playing later on in the Euros that probably won't go on the tour. Keep an eye on Bakayoku today. 35 million from PSV, says Eduardo. Yeah, heard about him. Interesting player to keep an eye on, but apparently Liverpool are leading the race on that. Uh, Ash says, when's your next tur Girth and Turf game? I'm meant to be on tonight at about 10 o'clock after the England game, so we'll see how that goes. Um, this upcoming season will be a great season for Anthony. He will know his worth, says Toma. 
And well, look, hopefully this end to the season is going to be a good season, end to the season for him as well, because I think we do need to see um, a push on from numerous players for Manchester United. Right. Um, I want to talk to you about McTominay. I want to talk to you about a couple of other things as well, but I'm just going to stop this poll because it's been hovering around 60% of you that wouldn't sign Michael Elise and 40% of you would. Rashford scores Saturday for four in a row, says Robert McCormack. Um, I hope so. I hope so, Robert. I've got nothing to say about that. So, Manchester United are looking to rebuild Old Trafford. Um... If we do that, we may have to move away from Manchester United. Um, there has been an article today that has basically put forward five places that Manchester United could play their net their games while it's being uh, rebuilt. Um, they are the Etihad, Lancashire Cricket Ground, which is down the road, which I think the capacity there would not be... Um, that big, uh, Bolton Wanderers. Um, in fact, I'm not even going to put the cricket ground there. It's absolute waste of time. Uh, or Blackburn. So where would you want Manchester United to play their games if we had to move away from Old Trafford for a year or so? Where would you want us to play? Etihad, Everton's new ground, Bolton, or Ewood Park. Now, the Etihad, I'm going to go through the capacities. I know that the new Everton ground is about 55,000. So, 55,000 for the new Everton ground in Liverpool, 53,400 for the Etihad. Ewood Park, Ewood Park is um, 31,000. And Bolton, I don't know, I don't know what Bolton Wanderers ground's called, is 30,000. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you've got Bolton for 30,000. You've got Ewood Park for 33,000. Then you've got the new Everton Stadium and the Etihad about 54,000. Where would you want to play your games? Because um, Liverpool isn't that far away from Manchester, but would you want a load of Man United fans turning up to Liverpool for a home game? Seems a bit weird. Um, Etihad is in Manchester. Still, see, still feels a little bit weird. Bolton and uh, Blackburn are more neutral, but 30,000 and championship clubs where the ground may not be the best. I mean, ideally, I think I'd like to play Everton. I'd like to play Everton because it's uh, it's a bigger ground than the Etihad, actually. It's 55,000. Um, and, you know, it would be a nice it would be a nice stadium, wouldn't it? But it's going to be a lot of traveling. It's going to be a lot of traveling. Um I personally do not think we will be in a situation where we do end up having to move. I think we will build a stadium next to Old Trafford, then knock Old Trafford down. And I think that will solve the problem because we can make money. Uh, look, from a purely business point of view, keep using Old Trafford, 75,000 people every home game, until the day the stadium across the road opens and then walk into the new stadium where it's 95,000. You know, you, you're just making money. Close it down, open it up. Whereas if you knock Old Trafford down and you go to the Etihad, that's 20,000 less every match day. You've got to play rent to Man City. I mean, you're helping their revenue at the end of the day. I can't see it. I can't see it, you know. I, I just can't see it. Um, uh, lower leagues won't mess up scheduling, says who to blame. Etihad will have record attendance first time ever, says Mario Franco. Um, I, I just can't see it. You know, it's, it's interesting. I'm just looking at the poll here. 30% um, of you say Etihad, 44% of you say Everton Ground, 16% Bolton and 10% Blackburn. I love these types of polls, by the way. Thanks to everyone who's getting involved. But, you know, you learn things when you're doing it, don't you? I just can't see United playing at another ground for a year or two while the current Old Trafford gets rebuilt. I just can't see it. Financially, it, it, it makes no sense to do that. So I think we will build this new Wembley of the North. And I think we will play at Old Trafford and then we'll stop one day and start there the next day because it will be very, very close to us. Uh, one thing I will say about the new ground, though, by the way, is and look, I don't want to leave Old Trafford. 
you know, I've, I've been very, very clear about that. I don't want Manchester United to leave Old Trafford. I want to stay there. It's it's like a church. It's our, it's our ground. I don't want it. I don't want it to go. Um, could we go to Wembley, says Ken? Look, I wouldn't be against Man United playing at Wembley, but would we be able to fill it out? It's in London. Um, I I think we I think it, you know what. I'd be, you might be surprised. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Man United could fill Wembley out every game. Um, what about the Millennium Stadium, says Robert in Cardiff? Even closer, yeah, you could do. Um, I wouldn't mind something like that. Take it on tour, you know. I think we could definitely do it. The, the bad side to that is there is Manchester is our home and there are a lot of Man United season ticket holders who are from Manchester. So that would... Um, that would hurt us, but I, I, I don't think it'll happen. I, I really don't, and uh, you know, I, I'd be very, very surprised if it did. Uh, to be honest with you, um, Etihad, we've done that one. Lower leagues, we've done that one as well. Didn't Spurs fill it out? Says Marvin AM. Yeah, but Spurs are a London club, and as Andy said, can you really go to London for home games? What I will say is, I want to stay at Old Trafford. Uh, but if we do move and they put a fucking running track around it, I'll lose my shit. Like, that cannot happen. That cannot happen. We can't have a fucking running track. I've played the game at West Ham. I've coached the game at West Ham. And I know you can move the seats over the running track, but they're still fucking miles away. Like, if you build a stadium with a running track, you can't get that compact on top of the players feel you just won't get it it doesn't it can't happen because of how big the running track has to be you can't get sections of a stadium on stilts to move that close which is why at west ham even with the running track covered up you're still miles away from the pitch that was something that someone mentioned to me i think it was james who, who sent us an email about it um and he's absolutely spot on we do not want a running track or a cycle track, Solid Blake. We don't want a running track or anything like that anywhere near it because you will lose the atmosphere. And that's something to bear in mind when everyone's talking about a new stadium. You do not want a running track. It will destroy the acoustics. You will destroy the atmosphere. It will be a, West Ham's a lovely stadium, but I'm telling you now, when you're playing there, you're miles away from the fans. Ryan Jazzy Lee has been a member for 15 months. Thank you very much, Ryan. And Kyle Richards as well says, I'd go to the Etihad. City will be in the National League and they don't want it. The Manchester City Council own the stadium, says Kyle. Uh, yeah, they could be by then, hopefully, with a bit of luck. Um, mostly people are saying the new Everton ground, which would be interesting, would be interesting. Uh... Radcliffe might want a, a cycling track anyway, says 50 sack. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, we've got to be wary of that. New stadium, great, but make sure it's a football stadium. We don't want a running track. Wembley hasn't got a running track. If this is going to be the Wembley of the North, we don't want a running track. Get rid of that. Um, Nickel says, I'm from West Ham. I agree. It's an amazing ground, but it's just, it's just, very, it's just very big and you're a very long way away from the pitch. Uh, let's talk about Scott McTominay. There's something floating around, not in the toilets. We won't have any of that chat. Um, there are some stories floating around about Scott McTominay today that Man United may well cash in. It's, it's contrary to what I was told a couple of weeks ago. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I think he'll get the new contract. But we have spoken about him quite a bit over the last few months. There's no doubt that some of his goals... This I've been very critical of McTominay. You know I have, but... I will not hear a bad word said about him in relation to the impact he's had on this season. There are certain games this year, Brentford especially, where if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have three points. So he is an important player to Manchester United in its current incarnation. But its current incarnation is a little bit shit, isn't it? Like, we're not very good. And I I watched the game with Man United and I would cash in. I would cash in. I think he needs to go for his own good, start playing first-team football week in, week out. You've seen how fit he is. He shouldn't be playing 20 minutes every week. He should be playing every week. He's really fit. And, you know, he's in his prime years now. I think he should be going to play first-team football. And he'll never be a first-team player for Man United. He'll never be a first-team player for Man City or Liverpool or Arsenal or Spurs. He really should be going to a West Ham or something like that and playing football. But also, it's the tactical side of it as well. Tactically, he's a homegrown player, so it's 30 million straight into your fund. But also, tactically, if you actually watch the way Man United play, McTominay does well when he can get in the box and pick up space and get on the end of it. 
Well, but that there's a downside to that. That's Rasmus space that he's moving into for a start. You can see it all the time. And also, when he does, what about those times where he takes up those spaces and he doesn't score a goal because the attack breaks down? He's out of the he's out of the midfield. The amount of times I've seen Man United's midfield with McTominay and Bruno in it, and they're both way ahead of the play, and we're being broken on in that big midfield space that you could park a fucking bus in because McTominay's gone trying to score a goal, Bruno's out of position, and you end up with Casemiro or Maynou all on their own being run at by two or three midfielders who've actually stuck to their position. So I think for me, McTominay should be sold in the summer because I just don't see any role for him other than that of an attacking midfielder, which he can't play from the start. So he's can only going to be a 20 minute player. And then when you bring him on, you can only really bring him on in a situation where you're chasing the game. Because if you want to control the game, he's going to be running off into the box. So I think he's, he's he is exactly what he says on the tin. He's a player that when you need a goal, you can throw into the equation and he has an amazing knack of doing that. But it's very one dimensional. And I think if we want to move to the next level as a football team in the way that we play and the way that we set up, then we need to discard players that really are part of not how we want to play. And I don't think, you know, people say Maguire, Lindelof, even Wan-Bissaka aren't the right, they're good players, but they're not the right side to sort of player for the way we want to play. I'd throw McTominay into that category as well. He's been a good player this season, but he doesn't fit the way we want to play. He doesn't. And, and that's why I'd be moving him on. Um, Ella Toon and Mary Earp, stars for Man United Women. This channel says nothing about them, says Aldev. Yeah, we don't talk about women's football on here. I'm sure there's plenty of people that do. You know what else we don't talk about as well? We don't talk about swimming. We don't talk about tennis. We don't talk about cooking. We don't talk about cycling. We don't talk about cars. There's plenty of brilliant outlets if you want to watch women's football. I don't watch it. So I'd be an absolute bullshitter to start talking about it. I'll congratulate them if they win the league. I don't know where they are in the league. Um... My daughter plays, um, not international football, she plays football. I like watching her team play when I can. But my thing is Manchester United men's team. That's what I watch. Don't guilt trip everybody in the chat because we don't talk about, we don't talk about the youth much either. I'm sure there's places that you can find for that, but don't try and guilt trip people into watching something because you think in 2024, everybody has to cater for everybody. They don't. There's nothing wrong with saying you don't watch it you're not educated on it, so you're not going to talk about it. I rest my case. Um, McTomney has been here for eight years. We literally have this conversation every year, says Liam. Yeah, and I think he'll be here for nine. I think he'll be here for ten. I think he may well finish his career at Manchester United. But what I'm saying is, I think we should be moving him on. Um, under Oli, McTomney and Fred play deep. It's clearly tactical from the manager, says Marvin. Yeah, but he can't play deep. He's shit at it. And so was Fred. Like, he can't play that position, Marvin. He even said in an interview himself, his best position is more attacking. Is Elise eligible to play for England? Um, I don't know whether he's embarked on an international career. I don't know. The ignorance of me is, why hasn't he? Because he'd certainly be good enough. I mean, he was born in England. He was born in Hammersmith in London. Um international career all he's done is france under 21s um and france under 18s so yeah although there was reports that he was considering switching his international allegiance to algeria um through his has he has a nigerian father and a french algerian mother so he could represent France, Algeria, England or Nigeria. Algeria, Nigeria, England or France. So he's not played for a first team for any of them yet. So there we go. Um, that's where our club fails, not selling players that aren't taking us to the next level, says Sally Devil Red 7. Well, yeah, I agree with this. I think you've got to... I mean, it's, it's not my job. It's not your job. But it's very, very clear that what we need to do is look at the profile of our players and, and and ignore the fact that they're a good player or they're a good lad and go, do they... F I mean, look, Sir Jim would be a hypocrite, but maybe he's a hypocrite. He sat there and said, we will decide the way that we want this club to play and we will tell the manager how we want to play and the players will be provided to play that way. Well, I think 
he's not going to say we want to play like Sean Dyche. He's going to say we want to play like Klopp or Pep or Arteta. And as soon as he says that, he has to remove McTominay, Eriksen, Maguire, Wambasaka, Lindelof, Donny van der Beek. You know, there's six players straight away that cannot play the style of football that Arsenal, Man City and Liverpool play. Will we do that, though? I mean, look, for me, I think we're almost, you know, there's one or two players that are crap that need to go. But I think a lot, a lot of the players we need to get rid of this summer is actually based upon being ruthless around the style of football that you want to play. Next season, do you want to be in a situation where you're parking your defence on the edge of the box? Is that what you want United to do? Because if you do, keep the current centre-backs. If you don't, you need to sell two or three. Do you want your full-backs to spend most of the time forward? In which case, you need to sell wan because he's a defensive right-back. These are the decisions United need to make. But I'm, I, I, I can't tell you what we're going to do with Maguire or Lindelof. I, I don't know. To me... It's logical what you need to do if you want to play a certain brand of football. Loving this chat, though. Uh, Chris Bell says, Buying Elise is strengthening our bench when our first team isn't good enough. He isn't getting in over Rashford or Ganacho. Waste, in my opinion. I agree with you, Chris. I mean, look, if we need a right winger and we're selling Rashford and we're going to put Ganacho on the left, sign Elise. If we're keeping Rashford, we're definitely keeping Ganacho. Don't sign Elise until you've bought two centre-backs, two full-backs, a midfielder and a striker. That's 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 all I would say. Mic drop. Um, if Rashford's leaving, buy a Lisi. If Rashford's staying, buy two fullbacks, two centre backs, a midfielder, and a striker. And if you've got anything left, by all means, buy a Lisi. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. In my opinion, that's all it is. Um, Chris Bain says, "Do we really want Rashford on 350k a week for eight goals?" <sighs> look, I, I, look. I don't want it. I don't look. I, I spoke to somebody. I don't think it was on a stream. No, I was, I was, I was, it was on the street. Not, it, was, it did start with STR, but it wasn't a stream. It was a street. I was talking to somebody the other day about Marcus Rashford. They were a Portsmouth fan. We were having a big chat about football, about what they're doing and what United are doing. And he said, what do you think of Rashford then? And I said, very disappointing. And he said, I'd sell him if I were you. And I was like, well, no, it's not up to me. And he said, no, I'd sell him. He's... He's never going to be the player that people think need him to be. He's never going to be someone who passes the ball. You can see that for England. He doesn't pass. He doesn't want to pass. He wants to score goals. In a certain team, that's absolutely fine. But it's actually the ethos of an Everton. You know, Everton can carry a player that just is very, very selfish. But Arsenal's, Liverpool's, Man City's, they don't. They, they can't carry players like that. They won't carry players like that. They want team players. And Rashford never will be one. So you should sell him. And I thought, bloody hell. That's not a United fan saying it. That's a Portsmouth man say, fan saying it. Um, look, I live in hope that Rashford will turn it around because I know we're not going to sell him. But I think there's a lot of people just saying do it. But I don't think United will do it. And then that goes back to what we were talking before about Ineos, isn't it? You know, we're going to set how we want to play. We're going to play this, but then you're going to keep players that can't do it. So who's really making the changes at the club? Or are you... Look, I know as well as you do, at the end of the summer transfer window, I'll know if Ineos are real or not. And what I mean by that is, if they keep certain players, they ain't real. They're not. Because if I own the football club and I want to, I want to play a certain brand of football, I know who I'm selling and it's ruthless. Absolutely ruthless. I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm buying, I know who I'm selling. Because I care about Man United more than I care about any player. And I know that those players can never play the way I want to play. So you're gone. I'm bringing these players in. It's a new start. Ineos ain't real if this is not a new start. If this summer's more of the same, what's new? What's new, pussycat? Whoa. You know, you know what is new? We're, I'm expecting an amazingly innovative new start. Let's wait and see what gets delivered. Um... Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'm going to move over to That's Football. We're, we're watching. It's a 7.45 kickoff. It's not an 8 o'clock kickoff, so I need to get moving. Um, that's Football. May news debut for England. I'm sure you're going to join me over there. Smash a like on the video and subscribe. We're back tomorrow morning at 10 on here, but I'll see you on That's Football in 5. Take care.